esteemed guests and distinguished panelists. It's a great uh, pleasure and honor for me to moderate the last section uh, of this event. Uh, inshallah, we will talk about the regulatory aspect and perspective of Islamic economics. Uh, we have four distinguished panelists, and as you know, time is precious, so time management, especially before the launch, is of utter importance. And uh, inshallah, I will try to manage the time as efficient as possible. And I, before beginning, I request uh, my distinguished panelists to use the time as efficient as possible, please. Uh, the fifth session, the last session, uh, the session's tema is the regulatory evolution in Islamic economy, exploring components, challenges, and uh, opportunities, is particularly timely and relevant. Uh, in, in this event, different aspects of Islamic economics was discussed up to now. And of course, the regulatory aspect of Islamic economics is very important. Uh, we will delve into various aspects of the regulatory uh, evolution in Islamic economy. The session is composed of four main topics. The first one is advancement in legal and legislative frameworks navigating the landscape of Islamic economics, which includes the regulatory frameworks toward better framework to develop Islamic economy, grounds, and systems. And Sharia governance and in financial institutions and regulatory oversight and supervision of Islamic financial institutions. And finally, the needs of the developments in legal and legislative frameworks within the scope of it's the first noisy. topic. Uh, the second topic is guiding principles, regulatory frameworks, and legal structures for non-profit models in Islamic economies with emphasize on zakat and waqf, which includes understanding the regulatory landscape for non-profit models in Islamic economics, legal structures and governance models for zakat and waqf institutions, role of government regulations in supporting zakat and waqf initiatives, and harmonizing zakat and waqf regulations across jurisdictions. The third aspect is titled the Quranic Legal Principles for Justice, building a legislative framework for equity and fairness, which includes Quran as the source of Muslim moralities and ethicalities, the, major, the ten major principles of justice in Quran, and the application of those principles in the regulatory framework and application. And the final aspect is titled unraveling legal complexities, exploring the challenges confronting Islamic financial institutions in Turkey, which includes regulatory frameworks, contractual structures, dispute resolution mechanisms, legal implications, and cross-border uh, transactions. The format of this session is follow. I will, inshallah, uh, introduce uh, the distinguished panelists to you. Uh, in a concise manner, then I will ask each of them to uh, present uh, their uh, topics. Uh, once again, I uh, kindly ask our panelists not to exceed 10 minutes for their presentations. Mm -hmm. And in the end of the session, inshallah, there will be a questions and answer subsection. Let me shortly introduce our distinguished panelists. Our first panelist is Professor Dr. Mohamed Sarak. Welcome, uh, dear Professor. Uh, professor Sarak is currently the Professor of Islamic Studies at the Department of Arab and Islamic Civilizations at the, Univer at the American University in Cairo. He got his master's with highest honors in Islamic Studies, also his PhD with highest honors in Islamic law from the Department of Darul Ulum at Cairo University. Uh, previously, Prof. Serak was the head of the Department of Islamic Law, Faculty of Law at Alexandra University, head of the Department of Islamic Studies at Darul Ulum Cairo University, Dean of Faculty of Islamic Law at International Islamic University, Islamabad. He was also acting director at Sharia Academy for training of judges, attorneys, and prosecutors in Islamabad. Uh, he 
also got the Egyptian State Incentive Award granted to his book, Islamic Law of Torts. He also wrote many books and published many articles in the field of Islamic studies. Our second distinguished panelist is Dr. Omar Usani. Welcome. Uh, Dr. Omar Usani is the Secretary General at the Organization of Islamic Cooperation Arbitration Center in Istanbul. Uh, Dr. Omar Usani was the Chief Executive Officer of the ILLM. He was also a visiting fellow at the Islamic Legal Studies program at Harvard Law School in the United States during 2011 and 2012. He received his LLB in Common and Islamic Law from the University of Ilorin, Nigeria, Master of Comparative Laws and PhD from IIUM. Uh, he, was the, he was a resource person on Islamic microfinance at the UN Habitat Workshop on Land Development in Islam. Uh, he was appointed as a special official to the director of IIUM, IIUM and was also a council member of the International Center of Wakaf Research at IIUM. With over a hundred publications in Islamic finance, Islamic legal studies, arbitration, dispute, uh, dispute resolution, and related areas, Dr. Umar was published widely in refereed journals and books on Islamic finance and law. He is a member of several professional bodies. Our third Distinguished panelist is Mr. Ahmed Bilal Sofi. Welcome, Mr. Sofi. Uh, he is an advocate of Supreme Court of Pakistan and senior partner of ABS and Co., which is a legal 500, and chamber and partner ranked law firm, president research so society of international law, and president Quran Covenants Research Center. Mr. Sofi remained federal minister for law during the caretaker government of 2013. He is a member of the ICC Court of Arbitration. He is also IDLO's board of members, trustee of the OIC Arbitration Center, and advisor international law center. He delivers lectures regarding issues concerning public and private international law at Common and Stoke College, uh, Navi War College, Lahore, and several other venues. He was member board of investment and visiting professor at Punjab University. He has represented Pakistan before ICC, ICSID, and ICJ as Pakistan's council. With over 100 published articles, he also edited books on nuclear laws, UN law on terrorism, and Quranic covenants, apart from authoring chapter in Oxford International Law Handbook. He graduated from Government College Lahore and completed his LLB from Punjab University followed by El Alim from University of Cambridge. And our final panelist is, uh, final distinguished panelist is Dr. Murat Yash. Murat Yash, uh, Dr. Murat Yash is assistant professor at the Institute of Islamic Economics and Finance at Marmara University and visiting fellow at the Institute of Asian, African, and Middle Eastern Studi Studies at uh, Sofia University in Japan. He has completed his master's and PhD in Islamic finance from INSEE. Why? in economics, Boaz University. He has been a visiting graduate student at ICMA Center, University of Reading, as well. His research interest focuses on financial markets, Islamic finance, and Asian studies. After this introduction part, let me start with uh, Professor uh, Mohamed Sarak. And Professor Sarak, the row is yours. OK. Uh, thank you very much, uh, sir, for introducing me, and uh, I hope to be able to uh, say what I have to say in this uh, meeting. First of all, uh, I think I have to uh, uh, clarify very much the uh, connection between Islamic law and Islamic economics. In fact, most of the scholars talking about is Islamic economics are just talking about the uh, general uh, uh, principles of Islam, that is Sharia, uh, and uh, to a certain extent, they ignore what we may call it the legal experience of the Muslims throughout the, th the 14 uh, centuries since the time of the Prophet. Just to illustrate, the concept mentioned today, or the hadith, indeed, 
referred to by Dr. Munzer Kahf today, la darara wa la darar. This is a very important concept and covering so many details in Islamic law. This big concept was translated into a certain very specific uh, legal uh, concepts as well under the title of Dhamanat. You, the first Dhamanat in, in, in certain uh, definition can be equal to the, uh, to the uh, concept or to the law of torts. So Islamic law from the very beginning discusses the, uh, the torts and the wrongs in order to uh, 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 impact the social, um, you see, the social uh, actions and to regulate also the life in the Muslim societies. What I wanted to say, that there is a difference between the uh, uh, big general concepts uh, enshrined in the Quran and the Sunnah and can be utilized also in Islamic economics. But what I'm inviting uh, to add to it is the uh, legal experience made by the Muslim jurists. It's very rich, but it requires, in fact, sort of infrastructure to uh, uh, analyze the implications of any institutions of Islamic law or any concept of Islamic law. Uh, for example, Islamic law developed the concept of abuse of right. When we usually talk about the concept of or the rights of ownership, uh, the Quran was absolutely clear about the protection of the right of ownership. But later on, the Muslim jurists tried to make some sort of limitation to the use of this uh, right of, of ownership. This, in fact, the, the Muslim scholars or the jurists, Abu Hanifa, for example, uh, made no restriction about the right of ownership. Every owner has every right to deal with his own property the way he likes. So that was the attitude of Abu Hanifa, which can be compared easily to the attitude of Adam Smith, for example. Later on, his own disciples made restrictions and limitations on the use of the right of ownership under the title which was discussed later on by Ashabi when he regulates the concept of abuse of right. Uh, the, uh, the abuse of right, uh, that was brought to discussion in France in the uh, uh, 20th century when an Egyptian scholar, or a student in fact, under the supervision of Edward Lambert, he discusses, he, Mahmoud Fathi discussed the concept of abuse of right, and that was used in the debate, in the prevailing debate at that time, uh, between those who were uh, firmly uh, uh, attached to the pure theory of Adam Smith, and those who were coming with certain socialist attitude. What I wanted to say is that certain concepts in Islamic law needs, need to be, uh, 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 you see, examined and used also for the growth of Islamic economics. This is very important in my point of view. There is a difference between what we may call it the legal experience of the Muslims, of the Muslims and the major principles uh, uh, forwarded by the Quran and by, by the Sunnah. And it, it, it is uh, not fair, in fact, to uh, leave aside all of this rich heritage which can take the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Islamic economics ahead to the uh, aspirations of the Muslim uh, community as well. Uh, indeed, the Islamic economics will have the real existence if it fosters the uh, aspirations and the needs of the masses in the Muslim world. Uh, without that, 
without addressing the needs of the, of the Muslim Ummah, in fact, Islamic economics will be left alone and will not be able to move forward for catering or uh, 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 resolving the needs of the, of the Muslim community. This is also very important that the uh, identity of the Islamic economics uh, will be uh, characterized by uh, 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 responding to the needs of the, of the Muslim societies. Sorry for that. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. Mm. So this is the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the two points that I wanted to uh, uh, emphasize. Uh, the need to, uh, uh, to inspire the uh, uh, legal experience of the, of the Muslims throughout uh, the, uh, their uh, history. Uh, to revolutionize, in fact, the Islamic economics as well. So we need, in fact, to, to make this uh, The Islamization of social sciences and the economics, in fact, was also very important in, the, uh, 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 in what we may call it the first stage of the growth of Islamic economics. This is very important to uh, uh, identify the characteristics of the Islamic economics in this very important stage, the first stage. Uh, it was focused on the, what I call it the prohibitions. Riba, gharar, يعني all of these ihtikar uh, or monopoly. That was the focus was uh, how to make uh, these prohibited uh, 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 actions a way for, for gaining the characteristics of the Islamic economics. Uh, but we need to go ahead and to. Uh, uh, implement or to attach the Islamic economics to the needs of the Muslim societies. I think this is the, uh, the second uh, phase of Islamic uh, uh, economics. Uh, uh, the the uh, Islamic economics, in fact, the concepts themselves were there from the very beginning. We, we can read yeah, just a few uh, traditions of the Prophet and we will know that the, the traditions uh, focus on certain uh, uh, criteria for the, for the Muslim conduct of their own uh, business. Uh, for example, uh, 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 what we call it, uh, yeah, I mean, m monopoly or uh, to, to bargain uh, when someone else is bargaining yeah, and prohibition of, uh, of, of that. Or to make uh, a sort of deception or even to control the market. Yeah, and any interference with the market was prohibited by the, by the, by the, by, by the prophet. So uh, this sort of freedom in dealing with the, with the market, yeah, and the free market was emphasized by the traditions of the Prophet. Um, uh, dear Prophet, one minute left. One minute yes, left, yes. okay. Time is passing. So uh, what I wanted to emphasize also <laughs> that we need to study Islamic law in a, in a different uh, manner to reveal the implications of this very rich system. It's not only to, uh, you see, to memorize so this sort of uh, 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 a new level or a new dimension of studying Islamic law is very much uh, needed uh, as well to go for the implications of the, of, of the system. Uh, for example, Awqaf, uh, that uh, uh, had big role politically, economically, socially as well uh, 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 in addressing health problems in the Muslim societies. So the institutions and the legal concepts of Islamic law are meant 
to serve certain real uh, 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 objectives. That will have to be taken into consideration. Uh, I, um, yeah, and I think uh, 10 minutes are not enough for the... We have to focus on the objectives of Sharia and to detail on them, to bring them closer to the, uh, to the life of the, of, the, of the Muslims. Cooperation, uh, 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 the, the uh, welfare of the, of the Muslim society, this is very important. And from the very beginning, in fact, the welfare of the Muslim society was considered to be one of the main objectives of Islamic law as well. So uh, uh, I believe uh, the Sukuk can replace uh, uh, and can work very well for the welfare of the Muslim society and in, in, in terms of investment, production, and uh, also uh, uh, distribution of wealth among the uh, several issues can, can be discussed. And in fact, I was uh, doing, uh, or I drafted a certain law for uh, Sukuk, and I call them the Sukuk of progress and development for the Muslim societies. So these are very important observations that I made for the uh, well-being of our uh, societies. Islamic economics will have its own real existence when it approaches the uh, pressing needs of the Muslim societies for uh, uh, power, for progress, and for meeting the needs of the Muslim societies. Thank you, okay. Mr. Popper. Uh, it, it was a great pleasure to listen to you, dear Prof. Of course, I am fully cognizant of the fact that 10 minutes is not enough mm. to reveal your deep knowledge on these topics. Yeah. But let's also uh, leave some time, especially for the question and answers. And I am sure audience is looking forward to asking yeah, you okay. some yeah. uh, good questions. Okay, let's move to our second distinguished panelist, Dr. Omar Osani. Uh, Dr. Osani will now present his paper titled Guiding Principles, Regulatory Frameworks, and Legal Structures for Non-Profit Models in Islamic Economics, with emphasis on zakat and wakf. The row is yours. Distinguished guests, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I would like to begin by thanking the organizers uh, for putting out this great event. And uh, I'm sure many of the participants have learned a lot from the great scholars who came from all over the world. Now, straight to the topic. This panel session is on the regulatory framework. And I'm glad we had a beautiful presentation initially relating to the need to re-understand Islamic law itself, you know, the professor talked about talks. It's a minat. These are areas where I think it's important for, for us to kind of have a deep dive into. So certainly 10 minutes is not enough. So this is something that I advise listeners to study very well, particularly the economists here today. The economists are top professionals. They have the conventional understanding they also need to have that kind of deep understanding of some of these principles in Islamic law. So I perfectly agree with uh, the professor. Now, going to the topic uh, before me today, which I'm gonna discuss in the next seven minutes or so, I'm told to speak on the regulatory framework and legal structures of uh, you know, nonprofit models, basically, focusing on zakat and waqf. These are huge topics. But again, I'm just going to give a very high-level discussion today, and uh, perhaps we're going to leave the rest for the Q&A. Now, one thing I would like to start with is, uh, you know, the introduction, you know, the potential of zakat and waqf. I'm going to skip that area. You all know the importance of zakat and waqf, generally. And uh, these are key Islamic social finance institutions. 
and uh, you have some estimates which have been given, or uh, some have put it that the global zakat pool is about one trillion US dollars. It could be more if you look at the wealth of Muslims. The problem is many Muslims actually do not pay zakat. So this is a, a big problem itself. So we have to check ourselves, you know, and if we're able to mobilize all these resources and tap into the potentials of our calf properties across the world, I'm sure we'll be able to transform most Muslim economies. When you talk about our calf, generally, I'm sure we are familiar with properties. You know, the first thing that comes to the mind when you say waqf endowment, it's, oh, there's a graveyard somewhere for Muslims. There's a mosque somewhere for Muslims. Now, we have to go beyond that, and many countries are already going beyond that, including Turkey, Malaysia, India. I mean, many countries have gone beyond that. So we've got to look at how to develop those alcohol properties. So it's extremely important. And this is where, of course, Islamic finance is relevant. You know, you tap into the financial resources to develop the idle alcohol properties. So I'm not going to go into further about these estimates we have, but again, it's important to consider a robust legal framework when it comes to Islamic social finance. Now, permit me to kind of uh, revisit the discussion we had in the morning. Uh, we had an excellent session. The first session today was on the importance of uh, Al-Adl wal -Ihsan, you know, which we all hear every Friday. And you had this panelists discussing this. Al-Adl itself, justice, rule of law. Everything we talk about in life actually starts with law. And that's why, again, if you look at the, 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 the whole concept of, uh, you know, Amr al Maruf or Nahyan al Munkar, it talks about regulation, what you can do and what you cannot do, what you should not do. And even though the Quran is not considered a kind of a code of law, it's actually, it contains what they call rules ahkam, general rules. And again, you have debate among the scholars, you know, regarding the, you know, the ayat al-ahkam, the verses that relate to legal issues in the Quran, whether they are up to 500 or more. There's a lot of debate going on. As-Sabuni actually has a whole book on ayat al-ahkam, basically. So uh, the Quran itself contains this rule. So when you talk about regulatory framework, we have to think of how do we look at Islamic law that was discussed earlier in terms of its evolution and apply it in the modern era. Modern era means you have positive legislation where the parliament itself makes the laws. So how do you kind of adapt the Sharia to the law by the parliament? So this is something very important for us. And we want to do this to regulate key Islamic institutions like Zakat and Awqaf. So this is what we have to do today. Now, the significance of a robust legal framework is everything. We, we all know that, that it's significant. Without laws, I can take money from you. I'll see I'm going to kind of use it for something to develop our calf properties. But who regulates me? It's just between me and Allah. So we have to have a framework on even the distribution. I take money from you. I distribute it properly to the right recipients. We have the asnaf mentioned in the Quran, the eight categories of those who can receive zakat. So when you take money from people, how do you ensure they are properly distributed? This is where we talk about the relevance of a robust legal framework. It helps a lot of things, even in standardization, which was also discussed earlier, in protecting the rights of the parties. You know, and this is where dispute resolution comes in to a large extent. I'm sure you're gonna hear some aspects of the Quranic dimension of it from my fellow panelists uh, in a short while. Now, one thing again, which has been re-emphasized many times during this conference was the importance of the political will. We saw that yesterday in the keynote speech, the special address by the president of this country, which talks about the, the consolidation of the laws relating to the financial industry. Everything is being put under one single legislation. You need that political will everywhere. You know, the last session we talked about, uh, you know, Malaysia, you know, what they have achieved so far. I mean, all these are actually driven by political will. So that's why it's always important for us to have the right people there, because they will determine the future of the economy itself. So the political will itself drives the successful case studies we'll be discussing today. Now, briefly, I know we have just a few more minutes. Let's look at Turkey, where we are today. I mean, if you talk about Alkaf, this is actually the center of Alkaf. Almost every corner in the city, left, right, and center, you'll see Alkaf properties. So, so what you have here actually dates back to the Ottoman era. I don't need to go down the memory lane. 
But one thing you have to note here is legal framework plays a key role. And I always say this anywhere I speak. It's interesting that you know, we are discussing the regulatory and legal framework at the end of the whole uh, summit. This is the last session. But this is, should be the bedrock of the summit itself. Uh, but again, the scholars will tell you, Hitamo who misc, you know, the last session should always be the, you know, the most interesting part here. So, the legal framework, you have it here, basically the Turkish Civil Code, you have the wax law and the re re relevant uh, regulations. You have the regulatory body as well, and they have gone so far in terms of registration and supervision, basically, of our CAF. And that's why you can visit even the Blue Mosque and others, Hagia Sophia, and everywhere looks good. So people actually are behind the scene managing that. So that's actually one case study that I believe other countries can actually emulate. Now, when it comes to zakat, I always talk about Malaysia, because here you have tax benefits. The Income Tax Act of Malaysia actually allows you to get some tax benefits when you pay your zakat. Now, what I always say is you don't need to reinvent the wheel in the Muslim world. We have best case studies. Let's have a platform where we can share ideas, cross-fertilize ideas, exchange notes, learn from each other, learn from best practices, and adapt those templates to our own regulations. This is what we should be having at the OIC level. And that takes me to the last part of the presentation on the conclusion and recommendations. Firstly, it's always important, when we talk about Islamic social finance, the bedrock should be the legal framework. We should try to establish a robust legal framework, an enabling legal framework. This will help to transform the economy itself. So that's the first thing. Secondly, how do you enhance the scope? Again, we have kind of the Sharia governance framework, which again has been discussed earlier. We have to look at the instruments, the market infrastructure, the regulatory authorities. All these have to be contained in the law we are talking about. Of course, Sharia governance is important. Now, when you have a law, how do you measure or how do you actually identify the impact of that law? So there should be some form of impact assessment after like a few years of the implementation of the law itself. That's why the measurable outcomes is important. Finally, cross-border collaboration. This is extremely important. At the OIC level or at the level of the Muslim countries, if we have any kind of forum, it's important to establish that kind of forum where we share notes compare kind of ideas, you know, we cross-fertilize ideas, and ultimately we can actually kind of learn from each other and uh, ultimately adapt. Again, I'm not talking about adoption here. We adapt the laws of other jurisdictions to our own countries for the betterment of the Ummah and to empower the people. Wassalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Let's move to our third distinguished panelist. Mr. Ahmed Bilal Sofi. Uh, he will now present his paper titled The Quranic Legal Principles for Justice, Building a Legislative Framework for Equity and Fairness. Uh, please, the row is yours. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, honorable guests, delegates, members of the panel, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum. I will be talking to you with reference to uh, principles of justice, principles of fairness in the Quran and how under law we can relate the both and what is the need of necessary legislation in that. The starting point would be to formulate that the Quran for each one of us in addition to being the ahkam is also a covenant that Allah has with each one of us, the believers. And from amongst the believers, those who do the trade, those who are into financial work, those who are into business, or those who are doing any kind of entrepreneurship, with them, the Quran has a very specific covenant. I call it the covenant with the entrepreneurs. And that covenant that Quran has with the entrepreneurs creates a personal responsibility on every believer to fulfill certain obligations for which not only he may be rewarded in the jurisdiction herein, but also in the jurisdiction hereafter. So two distinct jurisdictions 
are recognized by any Muslim believer on account of his belief, the jurisdiction herein and the jurisdiction hereafter. So everything that we do is to be related to what we get here and what we eventually get in the jurisdiction hereafter. So I would suggest that while we take Quran as a covenant between the believers and within the believer, the subset of entrepreneurs, we have to understand that the covenant requires the believers for fair business practices. And the fairness in the business or the ethical fairness could be drawn from the Quran, could be drawn from Masul e Fiqh, could be drawn from Tafasir, could be drawn from Sunnah, and it could be drawn from contemporary legislation that exists in each of the countries relating to multiple issues on business practices, competition commission compliance frameworks, laws relating to abolishing of bribery, laws relating to transparency, corporate good governance frameworks, that all means compliance. So entrepreneur's obligation toward the Quran is to honor what he agrees to. And my formulation is that since every law in every country is also a legislative covenant, so therefore, as entrepreneurs, we have a duty to, up, to hold it up. The crucial role of contracts in entrepreneurs, in entrepreneurship and economy the Quran tells us very clearly we have to write what we want to talk about, what we want to transact. The specific tutorial provided, only divine book which provides a tutorial. Knowing full well the significance of sanctity of contract, it's so important for economic development. No wonder Article 1, sub-Article 10 of the US Constitution talks about exactly the same thing. You have to uphold the contract and you will not make any law which abrogates a contract. Striking similarity, the Quran is trying to take us towards economic prosperity. Oral promises have to be upheld contrary to the law of contract that we have, contrary to the Vienna Convention on Laws of Treaties. One of my team is working on the comparison of the Vienna Convention, Laws of Treaties, which does not make admissible oral contracts. The Quran treaty law, the Quran contract law makes oral agreements admissible for the jurisdiction hereafter. The seed financing of a startup, a strategic text of the zakat, inducing entrepreneurs to put into motion the ideal assets. The following the sunnah of the entrepreneurship of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, what a successful entrepreneur he was. And what are we, to, are to, to what extent are we following could be a separate topic. Upholding business standards, Everything that you have, whether it's ISO 9000 framework, whether it's the metrology domestic legal framework, we have it in India, we have it in Bangladesh, we have it in every country, including Pakistan, metering associations, ISO 9000 frameworks, standards relating to garments if you are a manufacturer, standards relating to banking practices if you are a banker, standards relating to each and every standard licensing regimes of a lawyer, licensing regimes of a doctor. They are all standards which have to be up, upheld. The iron ring of the Quran is a subject that we are working on in which we identified in, in, in Canada. When an engineer graduates, they are given an iron ring to make them recognize the importance and significance of engineering standards that have to be kept up. Failing which, the bridges collapse. So the iron ring of Quran is telling us we have to uphold each and every professional standard no matter what profession we are in. Corporate social responsibility, bribing prohibited, something which was in Quran today is in UN Convention on Corruption, uh, 2013 was negotiated and they are globally recognized wrongs. Covenant of fair marketing and customer satisfaction Riba, of course, is the main theme that we have been discussing for fair treatment of labor. Now, the corresponding, while labor is very important and their treatment is so much accorded in the Sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon, there are specific ahadith 
But if a believer has this in mind that while complying with International Labor Organization Convention, he is fulfilling what the Quran mandates, so he will get the credit for the jurisdiction hereafter, or law, labor laws of any country. So my view of economic architecture of the Quran is four covenants that Quran has with each believer and potential arbitrator. One is to uphold the contracts. Every contract that you make, no matter if it's a private contract, if it's an oral contract, if it's a business contract, contract with friends, wives, people to meet, everything has to be upheld. You are accountable for that. Covenant to excel, ladies and gentlemen, means as a Muslim, as a believer, we have an enhanced duty to excel in this world, in the worldly role, because we are the Khalifa, we are the deputy, we are declared. Our creator has made a claim in respect of our capabilities that I am creating the best of the best species. So it's just like a teacher telling certain students, he, in my view, will do very well in exams. Now the onus shifts on the students to perform. If they don't perform, they are not fulfilling the claim made, the, the honor of the claim, the integrity of the claim has to be honored. So for every Muslim, excellence in the worldly role is part of the syllabus of being a Muslim. Covenant with you get traders, traders and covenant with mediators and arbitrators. In order to excel collectively as a humankind, as the finest race, as the finest species, as the finest group, you have to eliminate facade and dispute. Because if that will have happen, we can't progress together. So Allah has a specific covenant with potential mediators to step in, to volunteer, and resolve a dispute of any nation and category between families, states, peoples, traders, amongst. So ICC arbitration, ICSID arbitration framework, London Court of Arbitration framework, OIC, of course, my colleague sitting here. I'm OIC. OIC. I'm ICC <laughs> member and he's an OIC Secretary General. So you're fulfilling the covenant with Allah by, by running the center as good as you can possibly can. This is further explanation. I don't have the time to specifically go through uh, the references which I have given, but I have summarized it. But for those who wish to take the uh, copy of this, they can. Finally, covenants to uphold uh, contracts will include private, con private contracts, treaties, because Akud and Misak includes all these three. It includes private contracts, it includes the treaties, multilateral, bilateral, and it also includes legislative covenants, because you have a social contract with every state, every citizen, and the political science theory has a social contract with the state. It has a duty to be compliant with the laws. So in that sense, every legislation of every country, barring where it is in contradiction with Quran, that we can steer clear of or you can challenge it. But barring that, about 95% of legislation in most of the countries is in conformity with the Quranic principles. That needs to be upheld. So private contracts have given just a few examples. Finally, if I may come to one more important point, when we say we need Islamic law and Islamic Sharia in respect of everything that we are dealing with, are we talking of creating a new codified framework parallel to what already exists in the world? My submission would be not required. What exists should be leveraged. This is what exists. That needs, we not specifically say we are having an Islamization of a specific international legal regime or a bilateral regime. This already exists. And if it is advancing a maqasid sharia in one way or the other, something that we intend working on to identify some international conventions which are, which are in conformity with the maqasid sharia itself, then why not? Why not to adopt them as a religious duty and when fulfilling them, have a near that you are doing it because your Quran tells you. So you not only be achieving a worldly success, but also getting the credit in the hereafter. So in this occupied legislative field means sometimes a legislature occupies a field and, re and leaves the remaining to others. The federal government may identify certain areas it wishes to work on and, re and leaves the remaining to the provinces. So Islam is, for example, identified. Quran has identified occupied field in these areas. These are the areas that we can legislate, draft regulations, regulatory frameworks, whether in Turkey, whether in Pakistan, whether wherever, whether at a, at a global level. But the remaining needs to be adopted. So last, last one minute. 
yeah, existing legislative frameworks not inconsistent with the Quranic principles. We are specifically working on this to see, to measure, to match these with the various uh, 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 sharia and also the principles of the ayats and various sunnas and how they dovetail with it so that there's a wholeheartedness to perform these because these are the instrument of success if you want to achieve ghalba in the world the ghalba cannot be achieved now through, because the UN charter has prohibited acquisition of territory you can't occupy territory through use of force as traditionally our heroes Muhammad bin Qasim and Tariq bin Ziyad would do Today, ghalba is through legal mechanisms available globally. And if they are inconsistent, they must be fully made use of. So, uh, occupied field, and then in my submission, we should have some venue where we declare adoption of the ones that we are. So, uh, uh, this will be long. I'll leave it here. And uh, I think we can conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Shall let's. Have okay, thank you very much. So let's move to our last panelist, uh, Dr. Murat Yash. Uh, Dr. Yash will now present his paper titled "Unraveling Legal Complexities: Exploring the Challenges Confronting Islamic Financial Institutions in Turkey." The row is yours. And thank you very much, Dr. Tarek. Uh, yesterday. Uh, our president Recep Tayyip Erdogan mentioned that he was not very satisfied about the current market share and the total assets of uh, Islamic financial assets and Islamic financial institutions. So maybe the Islamic financial regulations and legal framework in Turkey might explain that reason. So in that sense, that presentation can be beneficial. Uh, actually, this is a like the findings of our uh, a research project that we conducted last year that is funded by OIC. Uh, Islamic financial legislations and regulations are very essential for the growth of Islamic finance industry. So that is why in many countries uh, there are research dedicated to Islamic financial regulations and legal framework. But uh, there is a very limited come, research come. dedicated to Islamic financial regulations and legislation issues in Turkey. That's why we conducted this research and it was the, the first qualitative research in this area. So if you look at the regulatory infrastructure for Islamic financial institutions and products in Turkey, it is very sophisticated. There are so many different regulatory bodies which are responsible for different Islamic financial institutions and for different products and that's making uh, the legal framework and regulations more difficult to prepare. So we conducted 12 interviews with very key stakeholders and policymakers in Turkey. They are from Islamic financial institutions, they are scholars from universities and they are from the regulatory bodies in Turkey as well as presidency office and Participation Banking Association of Turkey. So we have three main findings here. Uh, I will try to make it short. First main finding was related to regulatory governance. Before we started this research, uh, actually we didn't expect that regulatory governance might be an important issue uh, in terms of preparing the robust legal and regulatory framework for Turkey but it happened to be one of the most important issues in Turkey at the moment. So what are those issues? As I mentioned, there are so many different regulatory bodies in Turkey, and sometimes their legislations or the law they prepare might be in the responsibility of different regulatory bodies at the same time. So it is very important to clarify the roles of different regulatory bodies. What are their objectives? What are their functions? and if they need coordination with other regulatory bodies, how they should coordinate. The second is the organization, organizational structure. So it is very crucial that the regulatory bodies in Turkey should be well trained in the area of Islamic finance so that they can prepare a robust regulate regulations and legal framework. And also it is important that uh, they should have a dedicated an Islamic finance department in each regulatory body. Third, transparency and independence. So 
it was a common in Turkey, a common practice in Turkey that just certain regulatory body or a certain number of limited individuals focusing on a developing a regulatory framework which can affect many stakeholders and also other regulatory bodies. So that kind of practice is actually affecting the quality of the regulations and legal framework in Turkey. Another issue is the engagement. So it is very important that the scholars from the universities, the different regulatory bodies, the members from those regulatory bodies, and the practitioners from the industry, they should come together and <coughs> discuss what should be the <coughs> legal framework and regulations suitable for the industry. If they only design by certain limited number of individuals, again, many problems are coming from those regulations and the legislations. And the decision making and predictability is very important. There should be a certain model for decision making which should be consistent in the long term. So in Turkey we have observed that uh, certain regulatory body make a decision, make a regulation, and after a few years another person come and remove that, abolish that uh, regulation and come up with a new one. So it is not consistent and is also affecting the confidence on the industry in terms of regulations and legislation in a negative way. So there should be a model for the decision-making procedures. The second main issue is the legal and regulatory framework. Uh, so we are talking with the colleagues and practitioners and policymakers about what is happening with the latest uh, Islamic Financial Act for Turkey. So maybe before discussing that, we should talk about constitution because in our interview results, we find that especially the post-coup constitution in Turkey has very high emphasis on laicism and secularism in Turkey. And it is not very clear what is the borders and definition of this secularism. And it is also currently very hotly debated in Turkey whether we should update the constitution by defining what secularism really means or not. Because a strict interpretation of secularism can limit and put a legal barrier for development of Islamic finance industry in Turkey. And that is also decreasing the confidence of, on the industry in Turkey. Second issue, uh, Islamic framework is a subset of conventional framework in Turkey. And that is the common practice in the Turkey now that even the Islamic financial institutions, participation financial institutions in Turkey, are somehow happy about this practice because they don't want to have any disadvantage uh, while they are being the part of the same market of the conventional financial institutions. So they want to have similar regulatory framework, they want to have similar taxation, they want to have similar incentives and similar abilities that these conventional institutions have so they are afraid that if any legislation comes, maybe they can lose those advantages. But at the same time, as we know, the Islamic financial institutions should be different because they are asset-based institutions and their products should be asset-based. So it is very difficult for them to use same products with the conventional ones. So often they are using omnibus bills, in Turkey we call torbayasas, uh, so that they can solve their legal problems but that is also coming up with an, another problem. So Sharia governance and legal infrastructure. So if you look at many other countries, when they have an act for the Islamic financial services, the Sharia governance framework is the most and important and main part of those legal framework. But in Turkey, it is like a missing in important legislations, but just mentioned in the just certain regulations. And that is causing also a problem again. Conventional financial product mimicry is another issue because once Islamic financial institutions use similar uh, taxation laws, following same taxation laws, same commercial law, same banking law with the conventional one, they are starting to imitate conventional financial products and services. And even sometimes in the, in the past this happened, they feel they have legal rights to use conventional products basically because they were in the same law before. And the taxation is another issue because Islamic financial products are usually asset-based and based on like a real trade, similar transactions. However, 
it can create an additional tax burden for the Islamic financial institutions. At the moment, Minister of Treasury and Finance is very helpful for those problems, like if there's an additional tax, they are fixing that issue, but uh, it again requires a sustainable solution for the future. Hierarchy of norms, and this is very important again, as I mentioned in the beginning, regulations must follow the laws and laws must follow the constitution. So if they are not suitable with each other, the regulations will not have any enforceability in the legal term. So in that sense, maybe before starting an Islamic financial law, maybe we should start making change in constitution and then gradually coming to a law, communiques, decrees, and then regulations step by one, step by step. And the last one, most of interview participants suggested that a, a specific act for participation finance is essential to provide a comprehensive solution. However, again, it shouldn't create any taxation burden or legal burden or burden on any activities of Islamic financial institutions and they can have a neutral competitive market with the conventional counterparts. And the last main issue, yeah, I'm just uh, summing up uh, international standards and regulations. So we find that universal acceptable standards are important to save time and to save labor for many countries, including Turkey. But those standards should be on the vol voluntary base. It shouldn't be mandatory because different countries might have different legal framework, different constitutions, and different cultures. And the last one, we have global financial start setting institutions. And uh, their standards for conventional financial institutions are very important. And when we ask interviewees whether these standards can be used also for Islamic financial institutions, they said yes, they are important because they are practicing in the same market. However, there need to be some adjustments for Islamic financial institutions. So in that sense, the national regulatory bodies and international Islamic financial standard setting institutions should actively involved in those bodies to come up with certain uh, standards for Islamic financial institutions. As a so conclusion, so Islamic finance started in, in Turkey almost 40 years ago, but especially the legal and regulatory frameworks started to develop, especially in the last years. So our research reveals that there are still many issues that should be improved in terms of legal frameworks, regulatory governance, and international standards. And it is very fundamental to establish a clear legislation for participation in financial institutions, and the regulatory bodies must improve their governance, and unified standards are crucial for global integration of participation finance industry into global market. And finally, those standards should be used voluntary based, not by compulsion. So this is our research on these issues. If you want to read in detail, you can get access to those papers. They are open accessible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I specifically thank to all of our distinguished uh, speakers for complying strictly with the time limit. Indeed, we are behind the schedule, so unfortunately, I will not be able to take questions from the audience. Just uh, as conclusion, let me uh, summarize in one sentence for each of our panelists some provocative uh, takeaways, uh, personal takeaways. Firstly, I think Islamization of knowledge has uh, decreased or weakened the link between Islamic law and Islamic economics. Secondly, we should think globally on zakah and wakaf issues, especially today. Uh, but uh, legislative and Sharia uh, standardizing, standardization is big issues to, to overcome. Uh, thirdly, justice is of course at the core of Islam and the biggest economic problem for now is the wealth inequality and we need to, uh, we need the covenants to be internalized by believers, full compliance with the pillars of the contracts uh, to solve this problem beyond all of the economic, monetary, taxation policies. This is very important, I think. And finally, of course, in Turkey, participation finance 
act is the most crucial, most important, but the most difficult part of the participation finance strategy. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us on this issue, inshallah. Okay, I am uh, finalizing uh, the, uh, this session. I wholeheartedly thank all of our distinguished panelists uh, for their deep knowledge. Thank you very much.